Uh, my name is Bill Ziegler, and I am just thrilled to be with you today uh, with four good friends that are just outstanding men and leaders in education. I learned so much from them. And uh, so what I want to do is I want to just share my screen real quick. As we jump in, I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, before we get started, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what, what's going to happen today. Uh, so this is strategies for leading a culture of unity on authentic and all, uh, on race, unity, and leadership. And really, we're going to really dig in to some of the heart of the matter that may, may make you and me uncomfortable. And that's a good thing, because I think that's how we grow, and that's how we develop. So I, my hope is that we do become a little uncomfortable in today's conversation as we learn and we grow. These are uh, four very good friends of mine. Uh, these are just great men. I follow them. I, I consider them colleagues, but I learn so much from them. So Marcus Beelan, um, Marcus is hoping to join us. He's at a school event right now, handing out diplomas to many of us. Uh, Marcus is a, a principal uh, in, in Illinois. Uh, Dwight Carter, Dwight Carter is, uh, Dwight and I, Dwight is a National Association of Secondary School Principals Digital Award winner, Digital Principal of the Year. And uh, Dwight and I, I think it was in 2017, were the closing keynotes for the National Principals Conference so I always hold a special connection with Dwight and thank Dwight for being on here. And we're going to give them all a little bit of a moment to introduce themselves, but I just want to go through that. And then we have Quentin Lee, Dr. Quentin Lee. He is in uh, Alabama, Childersburg High School in Alabama, and he does some great work down there. And you can recently listen to a podcast. He did several podcasts for us just recently on Lead the Way. And then Derek McCoy. Derek McCoy is also an NASSP Digital Principal of the Year. Uh, he's now an educator in North Carolina. And there's something very special about Derek. I'm gonna stop the screen share because I have to share this with you, right? So um, I'm gonna stop screen and share it. I just wanna see everybody, connect with everybody. And, and here's what I want you to know. So uh, Derek, so I wear bow ties a lot. I don't know if you've ever noticed that about me. But one of the things is I learned how to tie a bow tie by Derek McCoy at a PA principals event. Derek said, "You're because I had a clip on, and he's like, that's embarrassing, Bill. You should not be wearing a clip on. You should be wearing a real bow tie. So sure enough, I jumped in, wore that. He taught me how to bow, tie a bow tie. This is the wacky thing. He taught me how to tie it around my thigh first and uh, it worked. And I'm a left-hand guy and I think he's right-handed, but it worked. This lefty learned how to tie bow ties. And uh, thanks, to, thanks to Derek. So gentlemen, thank you so much for being on this. I just want our listeners to know this is a panel discussion that we are just going to be uh, talking back and forth. I want to remind you, if you just jumped in, we ask that you uh, mute your microphone, turn off your camera, so all the focus can be on on the speakers. Uh, so let's let's. Uh, I don't think Marcus is with us. So Dwight, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, first, my heart and my heart goes out to you guys. Um, I know your state's struggling through a number of things right now, so we, you know. From Ohio, we, you know, we, we care deeply and want to make sure everyone stays safe. Um, this has been a huge awakening for our entire country. Um, but, uh, my name is Dwight Carter. I'm a, uh, assistant director at Eastland Career Center. This is my 26th year in education. Um, heavily involved in leadership over the last 17 years of my 26 year career, formal leadership. Um, was a classroom teacher for eight years um, as a social studies teacher. Foundation of All Knowledge, uh, eighth grade and also high school. Um, have some coaching experience as well. Um, ultimately, my passion and my um, mission is to positively change lives and impact futures, and I'm able to do that through um, education. So great to meet you guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dwight. Appreciate it. Quentin, how about you next? Hey, good afternoon and good evening to everyone that's on this call. It's just an honor to be here and share this space and this opportunity with you guys. I'm Dr. Quentin Jerome Lee. Uh, from Alabama. I'm a high school principal, but first and foremost, I'm, I'm a, a husband, I'm a father, I'm a believer, and I love kids. Uh, education saved my life, literally. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't be here uh, where I am today if it had not been for educators that poured into me. So that is my goal. That's my hope, and that's my passion as a leader to instill that within the teachers that are in my building, as well as establish relationships with students. So uh, I do a lot of things to engage students um, in school outside of the normal hours of eight to three um, in hopes that we would make those connections that will become lifelong um, relationships. Uh, I definitely 
think that uh, it's just a joy to be on this call. And thank you guys for reaching in to try to provide a service for your kids that are going through this pandemic of the COVID-19 as well as the pandemic of racism. So thank you all for being change agents for your communities and your schools. Thank you. Thank you so much, Quinn. Really appreciate that. And great to have you. Uh, Derek McCoy, why don't you introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and I want to thank Bill for the for reaching out to me and sharing his space here with, with um, to discuss this uh, much needed topic. To everyone here, thank you for what you do. Thank you for every inch and uh, of energy that you give and, and every inch that you claw out of success and effort and work uh, in your schools, from your teachers, from your students, because you know, this is hard work. Um, it's often unappreciated. Uh, people don't know what we put into it. So thank you for your dream and vision and what you do. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, middle. This is my 25th year in education. Uh, uh, middle school uh, starts in the middle. So middle school principal here. Uh, th this this is this is the work that we do on middle school math teacher, uh, assistant principal, curriculum coach. Uh, I love what I do every day. I embrace my mission of um, committing to making the least of us the greatest of us. So no matter if you, so that, that includes if you don't have a voice, you have a voice. Um, <clears throat> or if you don't know your place, my job and our calling is to help students find that peace. I, um, I embrace my mission. I embrace connecting with you all and helping you grow. I, I'm where I am because the people committed to connecting with me. So whatever I can do to help you in your journey, please let me know. I'm great because of my community and how they poured into me. I also want to say uh, to Bill regarding his bow tie, Bill was challenged by me to learn how to tie his bow tie because I was challenged by a digital principal to start wearing bow ties. And that digital principal who challenged me to start wearing bow ties is on this call right now. So, uh, Bill, you're welcome. Dwight, thank you. Dwight, white ties are much better than I ever will. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to say all that. I'm not going to yeah, say all that, but you know. Exactly. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being on. You know, this. I think this topic is, is so important in America today, and it's one that we can't be silent on. I, whether you are white, black, whatever color, we need to speak out and we need to act as school leaders. We can no longer sit idle. We must take action. And that's really why we came to together today. When I saw what happened in our country, in your city, over the last few weeks, my heart broke. And I, I'm sitting there and, and almost in tears as I see this. And I'm like, you know, this is so disheartening to see a man die with his, with, you know, on the ground like that, pleading for help. And, you know, I think it's caused... A, a needed change in our in our country but in our education world as principals i think we have a responsibility to lead that change and today you're going to hear some things on how we can do that so let's get started gentlemen um so you know let's let's talk and we're going to have we're going to just thank you so much everyone for keeping your cameras off when you come on uh just keep your camera keep yourself muted so we can see our panelists if you just top there too you can actually just say view active cameras so you'll see our panelists so gentlemen, let's jump into the first question. What are your thoughts on what's going on in our nation right now? Uh, I'll start. Um, I think it's um, indicative of you know, our, our history as a country. And I think what's interesting is that it seems like we've, we've hit an apex or a point where um, using a phrase that I've heard, I think more people are quote unquote woke now and they don't know what to do with that. Um, so woke means you're aware and you're actively doing something about a bias, a prejudice, or a pandemic as, as Dr. Lee mentioned. And so I think more people are feeling, um, because of what happened and the, um, the death, even though there was a lack, of, there, was re there was no resistance, the behavior didn't stop. And it was more, it was just a blatant um, disrespect for human life. Um, that's just a narrative that's been told year after year after year after year. And so there's a, there's a set in in our country, but there's also 
and anger and a rage that's a lot that comes along with that fatigue that's challenging every fiber of our being and when when that challenge happens and there's no outlet negative things can come out of it but also if you think about childbirth childbirth is very painful but the moment it happens is a blessing so i think a major blessing can come out of this if we act on this crisis now um and so i I know it requires a lot of patience, but there's a lack of, we don't, we just don't have patience anymore. So just like when there's any disruption in our country, the first place people look to the school system to repair, respond, rejuvenate, reconnect, and revive um, hope that may have been lost. So this is a huge challenge for us. And uh, and, I, and I've said this in a couple of meetings I've been in, um, it's a blessing and a curse that we're not in school. Like in Ohio, we're no, we haven't been in school since mid or late May. It's a blessing and because we didn't have an immediate response to it. It's a curse because we didn't have an immediate response to it and we're no longer with our kids. So we don't know what they're exposed to, what they're experiencing, um, what they're reading, what they're not reading. Um, do they have an outlet to share? Do they have a, a safe place to, to um, you know, dive deep into their emotions and want to question and, and, and figure out what to do next? So, um, for those of you, if you're still in school, I think, you know, use this opportunity to really connect and engage with kids. Yeah, I'd Excellent. like to just come in and say, I agree everything with what Dr. Carter said, but um, he mentioned patience. And that's the one point I want to bring out because patience without love and kindness is frustration. And that's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing a lot of frustrated people because of the, the injustices that have carried on for years after years after years. However, we've got to be mindful of of what's going on in the in the world, um, we've got to be mindful of the narratives that are being spun, uh, positively and negatively. Um, we've got to not allow the media to control our thoughts and our emotions and our feelings because a lot of that is happening. But as school leaders, we are trusted not to train kids what to think. We're not uh, trusted to train kids how to think. We're simply to give those the tools so they can think on their own. And I think this is a great opportunity, like you said, for some healing to occur, some real authentic healing um, on both sides of the, the, of the spectrum. Uh, racism is wrong. Uh, there are black racists, there are white racists. Racist, racism in any facet is wrong. And I, I think that this is a great opportunity for us to have some conversations about inclusion and a great opportunity for us to really check prejudices that we have on our own that haven't even been checked before, just those deep down feelings that we might have been taught growing up. So. I think this is a pivotal time in the history of our nation that we can really come together. And if we want change, the change has got to start within the schools. Yeah, thank you so much, Quentin. I, I, what you talked about there is you know, I, so powerful, looking at our own prejudices, just really, really, I think so important during this time for all of us to self-examine and self-reflect. Self Derek, any thoughts on what's going on right now in our nation? Uh, so, well, first, ditto and... Uh, <laughs> Massive rounds of applause to uh, Quentin and Dwight for what they said earlier. Um, there's, you know, we're, what we're going through right now is um, it, it, there. There are no words for it. <clears throat> but one, I, I do want to take a, take a slightly different angle on this, and that's to talk about the crowds that are reacting to what's going on. Okay, so you know when we've seen. Uh, black men uh, killed or harmed at the hands of the police before. There's been outrage, and we've seen some. We've seen the African American community, black community, and some and groups of some of, of of other communities respond. But now, when you look at the protests, the crowds, uh, you hear the news reports. You hear black. You hear reporters from all ethnicities saying that there are large amounts of diverse audiences out there protesting and making their voices known. So <clears throat> when I see that, um, it makes me think that uh, not just a, a generation of, of black students, but gener a generation of students of all ethnicities are responding to this and getting behind this cause. That's, that is that is a call for all educators. It, it, and it doesn't matter the demographic makeup of your school, whether your, your school is all black or mostly black and mostly white, the crowds that are out there reacting to it are diverse crowds. So they're participating, they're learning, they're getting involved. So now, just like uh, Dr. Lee was saying, it's incumbent upon us uh, when those groups come back to us 
what message are we going to have for them? What message are we going, how are we going to prepare them for their level of activism? Uh, in our book, we talk about student activism. At the middle school level, we talk about middle schoolers being the, the, an incubation point for where kids can uh, develop real passions for, for what they want to study in, what they want to dive into. Now we see that it's any and everybody. And, and people, more people are, are, are being uh, drawn to, to this talk. So we do have we do have to be prepared and ready to uh, to guide, to lead talks, to inspire, to help um, to help educate uh, our learners when they come back on on what can be done and what needs to be done because people already know what needs to be done. Now this is just the these are just the the groups and the audiences to make that happen. Yeah, great point, Derek. Thank you so much for that. Let's let's jump into our next question here. Have any of you experienced racism? And if so, how did it make you feel? Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll be glad to go first. I'll try to keep, I, I don't know how to keep this concise, but the short answer is yes, a, a, a lot of times. Um, I, um, I turned 50 last year. I grew up in uh, Southern Georgia, a uh, very rural area. And, um, you know, from fifth, fourth grade being called uh, inward, a group of us being called inward by our, by our fourth grade social studies teacher in class, uh, just talk, talked about how we were acting. Um, <clears throat> I think about, the, one of the first dates I went on with my with my now ex-wife in Savannah, Georgia, uh, when I was pulled over, I, I remember this it, on Abercrombie on Ab Abercorn Street, uh, being pulled over, and uh, and you know the guy the the police officer yelling, putting his hand on his gun, just being intentionally in intimidating. When my girlfriend, her son, uh, her son her little brother and my niece were in the backseat of the car. Um, and it was over just a lane change violation. Um, <clears throat> just this treatment for grades I uh, had to in, in college, um, all, all several, several, inc several incidents. I, I can name, I can name some, some more, but I really just want to draw from those that those experiences, you know, some are almost 40 years old, some are some are 30, some are 20 years old. You don't forget them. They they become part of, of your schema. Uh, they become part of your decision making and how you look at people. You know, uh, it takes real it takes real work to um, to mitigate that and to decide uh, how what kind of person you will be and how you want to treat people from those things. So that's something to keep in mind when you're looking at the learners in front of you, uh, because it doesn't matter what age they are when they experience it, they experience it and they're keeping that in their forefront when they're when they are having conversations with you, and when they react, when they react to you, please keep that in mind. That a lot of the reactions you get from students isn't about you; it's about their past experiences. Great, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, just being so transparent. Anyone else? Yeah, uh, I've experienced racism. Uh, of course, I think it was almost a rite of passage in my hometown. Uh, I grew up in a predominantly white area of 186 people in my graduating class, there were only 16 blacks. So there's countless times that, that I was referred to um, by the N-word growing up. But I think even back then, we were taught about our history, to talk to be proud, but we weren't taught to fight back the correct way. Um, I had a job when I was 14 years old. I worked at a little quick stop where it was a convenience store that, that had a deli. And uh, the person I worked for was very racist. He would make a lot of comments. But at that time, I was a 14, 15 year old boy that was needing to work to provide for my family. Uh, on Friday nights, my instructions were to get on my hands and knees and scrub the kitchen floor. Uh, at this time, I'm a young boy, impressionable, 
I'm making about $125 a week, which I thought I was rich at that time. But it was something that my grandmother grew up and she wasn't able to finish school, but she cleaned houses. So in my mind, because my granny cleans houses, this is something I'm supposed to do. And it's just part of it. Not realizing the whole time that I was racially being profiled. I was racially being, uh, being hurt and abused, but I couldn't see that at that moment. And uh, as terrible as that was, I'm glad it happened because it helped shape and define what I helped provide for my students. And that's to bring an awareness and to speak out, you don't have to take it. So um, racism is real. Um, there's multiple e experiences, even as an adult, um, just about two weeks ago, just purchased a vehicle, don't have to tag it because of COVID-19. I was followed for about two miles. And when the officer got to my school, I opened the door and walked out. He said, oh, hey, Dr. Lee. And I'm just wondering how would that conversation been had he not known my character versus following me for two miles when I wasn't even speeding. So uh, racism is definitely alive and it's a part of the almost the everyday narrative. Thank you, Quentin. Dwight, do you want to share? Or? Yeah, uh, you know, Quentin and Derek, but I think it's more of a, the question is more, when have you experienced racism, not have you experienced racism? Because racism is, again, it's, it's part of our foundation of our country. It was built and established on inequities. Um, again, we didn't, blacks weren't considered citizens, literally not considered citizens, based on the Dred, Dred Scott case, until, um, what, the 14th Amendment? Which, it, I mean, just think about that. Like, it's just absolutely mind-boggling. Um, I'm sure, I mean, it's earlier than that, but it's reinforced with the 14th Amendment. And it's like, why does it have an amendment? Why do you have to have an amendment to declare someone's citizenship and humanity? So let that, let's start with that. Bringing, bringing more so, bringing more so to the forefront. Um, I was first called the N-word by a, a little girl. She was younger than me. I was at, I was at a mall, going up an escalator with my friends in North Lamar, this place she used to always go. This little girl is probably seven, maybe eight years old. I'm going up and she's coming down. And you know, we met eyes and I smiled and she looked me dead in the eye, called me the N-word and her mom just put her hand on her shoulder and turned around and kept on going. I was, I was just shocked. I was just like, I was stunned to the point where I didn't act. And then, you know, so that stuck, I can still see her eyes, her hair, I can see everything about her. I'm 48 years old, you know, that was, well, 35 years ago, and I still remember it like it was yesterday. Um, more so, there's no more microaggressions than outward over outward aggression. So here's here's an example of microaggression. More out of just out of your ignorance, and I shared this earlier um, in a, um, with a group of students from New York. So my first year teaching, um, I was the first black male teacher hired in the building. So, you know, there were some like. Who is he? What's he about? So there was questions from kids like, did I get the job because I'm black? So I had to constantly battle that um, question because I knew it was there. It was even asked directly. So I had to really fight and work hard to prove that I earned the job based on my merit, not on my color. And so going into the second semester, I established great friendships with some of the teachers I worked with. And one of them started to feel really comfortable you know, asking questions or making statements. Um, and so in her, in her, um, in her way, just, you know, again, I don't think she, I don't think she meant any harm about it, but just her ignorance came out. She says, Dwight, you're black, but you're not black, black. You know, and I'm like, so after I strangled her and they pulled their hands, I'm just kidding, I didn't touch her. I'm joking, guys. Um, in my head, I was just like, wow, you, I can't believe you just said that. So the other teacher was with me. She sort of, you know, put my put her hand on my on my arm and just, you know, just kind of shook shook like she doesn't, you know, she doesn't know. And so I felt horrible about that because I started questioning, I started questioning myself as opposed to questioning her. And I was questioning myself. It's like, what is it about me that she doesn't think that I'm black enough? But then after really reflecting on us, I started thinking like. Now, what is it about her that she sees blackness only in a small box? It was based on stereotype. And I felt sorry for her, but it also answered a question for me. The question was, how come a lot of the students don't like her? And just in her question to me, or her statement to me, she answered why students don't like her. It's because 
she probably exhibited and demonstrated many microaggressions towards students, especially students of color. And so I never had an opportunity, I never took the opportunity to, to confront her about what she said, but our relationship obviously changed dr dramatically. But for me, I never, I never ever forget that. Another situation where I had a staff member when I, my first year as a principal, um, in a staff meeting called me a boy. Again, we had a relationship, so we used to teach together. And then I became a building principal. She moved to the building I was at. So I had to call her in my office afterwards and, and you know, I sat her down. And I was, trust me, I was very uncomfortable having a conversation because of our rapport. But I figured, I, I knew I had to have the conversation for two reasons. Number one, I'm the building principal and you disrespected me in front of the entire staff. So to not say anything about it, I'm then teaching her how and teaching others how to treat me. The second thing is I want to I want to let her know and educate her to not ever say that again. So I said, you know, I don't know if you realize this, but you just called me a boy and don't ever call me that again. And she burst into tears. I mean, red face, snot bubbles, the whole nine. And I and I said, I, you know, I, I'm not trying to upset you, but I also want you to understand here's the historical context for why you don't call black men a boy. It's demeaning, it's degrading, and it's racist. I'm not saying you're racist, I'm just saying what you called me is, 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 is racist, there's a lot of history there. And I was like, I just don't want you to make that mistake, not just with me, but with any student, any parent, anybody you come in contact with from this point on, because it could create a very bad situation for you, and then you're viewed in a negative light, and I don't want that. So how I felt was I felt belittled, but then I also felt proud of myself for confronting it when it happened. And this was um, back in 2005 when it happened, so 15 years ago. But again, I still remember it like it was yesterday. Wow, that's powerful. Thanks so much for sharing your stories, gentlemen. You know, and and Dwight, you talk about um, you know when African American males became uh, legal to vote. One of the things is in the, in the book I, I'm reading right now it talks about white African-American females didn't get the right to vote until the 1960s. So, I mean, you think about that. That's in some of our lifetime that if you were a black woman, you could not vote in America. Right. And uh, I mean, that's that's still relatively current in my opinion. So, um, so, Bill, so Bill, if you don't mind, that is a piece that when we talk about two types of racism, individual racism and institutional racism, that is a piece that we often don't give enough talk or credence or attention to, and it and it can open and, and it can slip our, our, our gate, it can slip our uh, understanding. Um, that institutional racism is is real and is is pervasive. Is is where we are, and until we start having real conversations with students when they bring it up or until we start having real conversations with our staff and our schools about what we're doing that might perpetuate some institutionalized racist practices, students are still, still gonna be treated a, a, a certain or different way and we might be cognizant of it or not. So we have to commit to having conversations. We have to commit to uh, giving impartial looks to, what, to some things that we are holding dearly or some things that we have inherited, because if we shift or let go or adjust some practices, it might make a huge difference in uh, not just student achievement, but student well-being, uh, how they perceive themselves. There's there's so much there's so many layers to that piece to the institutionalized racist piece in terms of practices, especially in education, especially uh, in in society that. It, it's, it, it merits and warrants us to look and examine what we do and practice and put down on paper a lot. Yeah, yeah. jump in. I think we, we have to be we have to be aware. I'm just thinking back of a situation where um, I had a teacher that, and I know they meant well by it, but they were teaching the Holocaust and they had um, the students drew some swastikas. Well, there was swastikas that went up in the hallway of my school. <laughs> And that can't happen because of the implications that are behind it. However, from the teacher standpoint, she just thought it was part of the, the Holocaust and the history of it. And she thought I was suppressing that history. And I said, no, this sign right here oppresses many of the students that are walking up and down the hall. 
and it's very offensive to everyone. And this is not a representation of, of what our school represents. So we had to have a difficult conversation, but if you're passionate about your school and you really want a climate that's going to change, you've got to have those conversations. You've got to, to hit it head on. It's uncomfortable, but it's supposed to be uncomfortable because you're checking yourself. And if it was really comfortable in this world, all the world problems would be solved. But you've got to do whatever it takes to protect that culture that you're trying to have on your campus because what you are silent about and what you allow is what you approve and you put your stamp of approval on it. Quentin, I love that. What you are silent about and what you allow, you put your stamp of approval on. You know, I think about as school leaders, gentlemen, what can we as school leaders do to change uh, how students are treated in our school, to stop racism in our school, to stop the inequitable treatment of people of color in our school? What can we do as leaders right now to, to do that? And while you're thinking about that, gentlemen, our listeners, I just want to let you know, feel free to put in the chat any questions. We'll answer these at the end. And uh, you can see the gentlemen are, are working with the chat. So what are your thoughts, gentlemen? What are some things that school leaders can do right now that could, could really give some change for the fall? Um, I'll, I'll jump in and start and try to keep it, keep it brief. Um, first thing is um, create a safe space for people to truly share their, be vulnerable and share their their biases and prejudices and, and experiences and just and and listen. Don't judge. And the, so that safe space has to be done with you know compassion, meaning people are seen, felt, and heard without judgment, um, with um, with understanding, and with um, empathy. Um, because it, it, it the moment if someone shares a bias or prejudice they have and it's laughed at or criticized, you now killed that for anybody else to move forward. So that's that's number one. Number two is provide, make um, anti-racism a part of the professional learning that's ongoing. Not a one day workshop, not an hour workshop, not an online um, training, you're checking the box. It has to be an ongoing part of the professional growth and learning of the staff led by those who are experienced in it. And in my experience, we all, we often um, buck or shudder to cultural diversity training. Um, people tend to immediately get offended by that because they feel like, well, that's not for me. And so I always wonder, like, if you're offended by it, isn't that for you? You know, your, your reaction to that is showing something. Like, what is that? Let's dig into that a little bit. But it has to be ongoing. The third thing is review your school data and, and look at the discrepancies that may exist when it comes to access and opportunity to higher level courses, AP and honors courses. Who's taking those courses? Who's not taking those courses? What are the uh, requirements and hoops to jump through for kids to get to take those courses? Do they have access to that curriculum? And how early do they have access to that curriculum? Also look at and address and I mentioned this earlier, the microaggressions that happen in schools every single period, every single day. And, and that comes from the adult behavior. Um, and so confront it when it's seen, confront it when it's heard, um, coach people up on how to treat all students and, and be aware of their, um, their approach sometimes to students of color. Great insight. Thank you so much, Dwight, for that. Anyone else? Well, I guess mine are, uh, are three things that I think we need to stop doing as leaders. The first thing we need to stop doing is associating socioeconomic status with, po with uh, poverty with minorities. Like, that happens all too much. We say if the school has a high percentage of food reduced lunch, well, that's a black school. That can't be the narrative anymore. Uh, socioeconomic, their lunch status only defines how they eat, not how they learn. So that is definitely something that we've got to stop because it's labeling our kids and they're gonna be dealing with so many labels. So stop associating the two. There's a different skill set that you need to address the racial inadequacies that's in your building versus the issues of poverty. Those are two separate issues. So we've got to stop connecting those two. I think we also have to stop assuming. We can't assume just because educators in the building that they're gonna love all kids. We've got some things that we really need to work on and we can't assume that our, our communities are these loving places of joy. Like there are some things that we really need to have some conversations about uh, to bring healing. And we can't assume that our kids understand everything. 
And the last thing is, I think we need to also not minimize the feelings of our students. Uh, we've met with some of our students about everything that's going on and we allowed them to talk freely. And the thing is, is that I can't tell them how to feel. How they feel is how they feel. Let them get that out because I'd rather them get it out, process it, and we can provide our opinions, our thoughts, um, help them with the tools they need to process it so they don't continue to bottle up inside. And then you have race wars going on within the walls of your school. So we can't minimize because I don't know, my experience with racism is definitely different than what Derek may have experienced or what Dwight has may have experienced. We're all three black men, but we have different experiences with racism. And our kids are experiencing it in a different light with a lot of the unjust killings and senseless killings of uh, people such as Trayvon Martin that they affiliate with because it's a younger generation. So we just can't tell kids, like we can't shove them under the rug and say, just get over it when we don't know exactly what they're having to get over in their mind. Um, <clears throat> so I, without a doubt, Quentin, um, you know, I'm going to listen to you talk a whole lot more, Quentin. That, that's, that's some great stuff. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to, my advice Good to Ellie was right my advice to ed leaders right now is to be absolutely intentional in your efforts to create an inclusive culture in your school. Um, when they say put it, uh, it, it's all fun and games until you put it in writing, put it in writing, in a mission statement, uh, and in your talks, in your plans, in your addresses, to it, put, put it out there and be intentional and be about that mission. Um, <clears throat> I'm starting a new school here in North Carolina, and I, I told them our one of our three big big rocks this year is working on a culture of inclusivity. Period. So whatever that means, wherever we go with that, that that's that's what that that takes. Um, second piece of advice: listen more than you talk. So and, and listen listen with intentionality. Listen uh, to students and take them at their word and don't discount. Uh, if the student is having a bad day and you see a behavior and they say some things, listen. Don't react to behavior, listen. Same for, same for community members, same for teachers. Listen more than you talk. Be intentional in listening, uh, listening more than, than you talk or than you preach or you put in, putting words out there. And then um, model. If, if if they don't see you doing it, they're not going to do it. If they see you say one thing and do another, then it was worth nothing. Model. Absolutely be the model of the practices and the behaviors that you want to see in your school. Thank you so much, Derek. I think we had Marcus Bielan jump in. Marcus, if you're there, turn your camera on and join us. Feel free. Uh, just give us a brief intro, Marcus. We're... we're uh, well into this, but thank you so much for joining us after Diploma Distribution Day. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, hey everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Marcus Bielan. Uh, I serve as a principal of Huntley High School in Huntley, Illinois. Uh, we are doing five days of diploma delivery. Um, so I'm in day two and we delivered 130 diplomas to individual houses today. So it has been, it's been nuts and crazy, but it's been fun and rewarding uh, to say the least. Um, I am in my ninth year, complete my ninth year as an admin or in education, uh, my seventh year in administration. Uh, just also to completed my doctorate here from National Lewis University on April the 22nd, writing my dissertation on competency education through the lens of personalized learning uh, in a large public school. Um, so it has been uh, an awesome journey and uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here with you all today. Sorry for being late. That's all right. We're glad you're here. Glad you're joining. Just jump in. Hey, this next question, gentlemen, is is one that you'll hear a lot. I think from people, they'll say, "Hey, I'm I'm colorblind. I don't see color. I'm colorblind." Uh, what do you think of that? What's what are your thoughts on that? Can I jump on that one? Please do. Do I go for it? I, I'm um, right there on you. I'm right there on you. I um. Hey, you better whoo, hit a home run, man. This one is uh, th that 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 stings. That stings because while it sounds like you're being inclusive, you're really being exclusive, and you're showing that um, you don't see people as they are. You see people as you are, and seeing people as you are puts them in the box of 
your perception of them regardless. It could be women, men, black, white, Asian, Muslim, it doesn't matter. And you don't see that. What you're saying is I don't see you. So there's almost a lack, there's a lack of compassion and empathy. And again, I say compassion based on, you know, Dr. Brown says compassion is being seen, heard and valued. And you walk, I'm sorry, you're, you're walking with people and understanding them. But if you don't truly see them, like you don't see color, then you're ignoring a part of who they are. Therefore, you can't truly see who they are. Or you're saying, I don't see you for what you are, which is a black man. And so that's another issue, you know, you got to dive into as well. So I, I'm, I, I, I'm appalled by that statement. Uh, I cringe when I hear the statement. Um, and and it, it just, it, it just has to go away. Like we have to stop saying that. And the multicultural, multi, multi diversity, their diversity, um, grounding in America that's happening. We cannot continue to say we don't see color. It's like I see you, I acknowledge you, I appreciate you. I want to learn more about you and from you, just as I want you to learn more from me and about me. Dwight, I'm I'm glad you you said that. Um, you know, and and I'm I'm in the same boat with you. Uh, for me, I always tell people and, and my students as well as my staff, I say, you, you have a story to tell. Everybody has their own individual story. And in order to see that, you have to see people for who they truly are. So recognize that, uh, be able to celebrate that. Um, you know, I've, in, in light of all that has been going on, uh, my message that has been to my students as well as to my staff, um, and one that I left in my graduation speech was be unapologetically you. And for me, I'm an unapologetic black man and I'm proud and I can celebrate that. And I want people to celebrate their races and cultures that they come from, because that's the only way to be able to talk about diversity. It's going to allow me to to uh, to engage in conversation and learn about you and your traditions and uh, and what you're proud about and what you're happy about uh, and can celebrate. And in order to do that, you have to see people, you have to see color and you have to see race in order to to begin that conversation. My my problem with I don't see color and this and this is advice that, that, that I will give to, to this group and to anybody who, who listens is that when you say you don't see color, you are intentionally ignoring the life, the background, the stories, the people upraising the learner in front of you. When I say I don't see when, when you say you don't see color. You are saying that you don't hear uh, or, or that you don't value the stories that they're bringing, the background that they're bringing, uh, the things that they're being told at home, the home that they're in. It is absolutely part of, of, of a person's makeup um, that color is. It doesn't have anything to do with how you treat them. It doesn't have anything with, to do with how you feel about them. It is just an acknowledgement that, hey, I want to acknowledge you as a whole person. So when a high school teacher told me, and I didn't think about this then, but I think about it now, a high school teacher told me, uh, Derek, you know, I, I don't see color, blah, 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 blah. Looking back, why not? You know, my, my mom and dad are both black. They, uh, they didn't graduate high school, but they made sure that all of us graduated high school this is what my dad had to go through. So I'm not going through that, but this is what I'm going through. And I'm going through these things because I was a black, I was a, I was a black, uh, black child raised in Southern Georgia. Don't ignore me or my color or, or significant part of me. So don't ignore a significant part of the students in front of you, acknowledge it, embrace it. As, as a matter of fact, let them know about you. Share, share, share an important thing about you uh, as, as a term in terms of your color and ethnicity and your background. This is how we come closer together and not uh, and not push each other apart. Right. And I think everything has been said, but I will add that if, when I hear I don't see color, that means that you're admitting that you have a disability, the inability to see a person. And you shouldn't just see color. You should see beyond color. So those statements, I mean, black is not a disease. It is not something I want people to feel sorry for. It's it's a part of who I am as a person. So I just think that's just it's admitting that you have flaws. When you say you don't see color, you do see color. You're just saying that um, because you want everyone to know of your disability. 
gentlemen, this has been such a powerful, we're at 49 minutes now. I gotta tell you, this has been just so unbelievable. I just can't thank you enough. We're gonna get into answering some questions, but before we do that, how do our listeners connect with you on Twitter? Why don't you all share your Twitter, Twitter handle? Let's go with Dwight first. And before we do that, Dwight, why don't you tell us about your book that you have, Derek, your book that you have when you get it to yours also. Go ahead, Dwight. Uh, yeah, you can reach me or follow me on Twitter at Dwight underscore Carter. That's D-W-I-G-H-T underscore Carter, C-A-R-T-E-R. Definitely, let's, let's connect. Um, you can also reach me via email. Um, for those who aren't on Twitter, it's at um, Mr. Dwight Carter at gmail.com. So I would love to, you know, like I said, have a conversation or just answer questions or support or, or just listen, anything. So yeah, definitely reach out. Um, Co-authored a couple books, three books. The, the one that I think is more relevant for today is um, the latest one is Leading Schools. I'm sorry, yeah, Leading Schools in Disruptive Times: How to Survive How Hyper Change. And what that book is essentially about is you know we're living in hyper change which means we we're seeing exponential change coming at a much faster rate and before one change is over three more are on top of it and so we have to be very agile and make decisions on, on you know be informed but also make quick decisions while also engaging stakeholders um so at the rapid pace that's extremely challenging so mark white and i mark white's a guy i wrote it with uh, we established a framework called the Act framework which is cope adjust and transform so the moment a disruption happens, happens. For example, um, you know, Dr. Lee talked about swastikas being up in, in the in the building. That's a disruptive event. Now, how do you respond to it? First, you cope. Cope is what you do in the first 24 to 48 hours. Like you respond immediately, you um, address it, communicate, um, inform, and then follow up. Adjust means you then look at your policies and practices to see what what changes are necessary to adjust to or prevent that from happening again and then adjust to, you know, when it does happen again. And then transform is the transform of transforming of mindsets to get ready for um, a new process in terms of how you lead, how you learn, and how you engage and respond to disruption. So it's cope, 20, 40, 48 hours, adjust two to three to four weeks, transform could be you know, months in advance, but you still go back to the original disruption and make sure you're on the right track. Awesome. Dwight, thank you so much. We have just a few minutes left. Marcus, why don't you give us your Twitter handle and how people can find you? Yeah, absolutely. You can find me at Marcus J. Bielen, M-A-R-C-U-S-J-B-L-I-N. Um, you can find me there or you can send me an email at marcusbielen at yahoo.com. I have not written a book yet. I'm inspired by these brothers that uh, that I see that are doing great work. And I just finished a dissertation. So yeah, I got to take a little break and then I'm on it. I am on it and we're going to make it happen. So awesome. Good. Thank you so much, Marcus. Derek, why don't you go? You're muted, bud. I just put all my stuff in the chat, but uh, my Twitter is McCoy Derek. Uh, my website is McCoy Derek.com. Uh, the name of uh, I've, co-authored two books, but the one relevant here is called The Revolution, It's Time to Power Change in Our Schools. And it's, and it's just about shifting from old practices, from old thinking to uh, embrace th uh, practices, belief systems uh, that will empower learners to take the stage and the role that they need to be prepared for their future. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I just want to say that I followed Marcus and Quentin last night, read up on you brothers. You guys are awesome. Um, <clears throat> Bill, thank you for, for, uh, for, I appreciate you putting all this together. This is just the start of a conversation. And there is a question in the chat that we need to get to at the end of this, Bill. Yeah, we're getting to that. Quentin, you're up next, buddy. All right, I'll make it real quick. Uh, Quentin Lee, um, you can follow me on Twitter at Quentin J, uh, Dr. Quentin J. Lee. Um, the website is www.quentinjlee.com. Uh, also, if you type in Dr. Lee Sings a Song on YouTube, you can find my latest hit single um, in response to COVID-19. Yeah, it's amazing. I've heard of Quentin. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, people, you need to follow. He is quite the, uh, the vocalist. Thanks for sharing that. Gentlemen, we have just a few moments left here, so we have to make this quick. I want to respect everybody's time and keep it within the hour. But Tom asked an amazing question. He said, thoughts on school districts, community leaders who have made statements of support 
the concern regarding George Floyd and the current social mo movement. Thoughts on intentional steps to work with students now. What can we do? Uh, thoughts on intentional steps to work with students now when we are not in school and when we return in the fall. What can we do? Give him, we're going to have each of you just give real one quick thing that Tom can do with his students now or in the fall. Uh, I'll go really quickly. Um, one of the things that, that I'm excited about is utilizing uh, the platforms like Zoom and, and Google Hangouts. Um, typically, in these past couple of weeks, just checking in or past couple of months, just been checking in with students via Zoom and doing group meetings because our kids are ready to talk about it and they're ready to talk about it now. We can't wait. And so we need to capitalize on this and just open up that form to say, what are you feeling? so that we can first validate their thoughts and validate their feelings and be able to move and help them work through and grapple with what they're, what they're facing right now um, and not making a plan of how we're gonna do it, but let's just jump in, right? Like we can't wait. So I'm that's, gonna, go ahead. Yeah, I'm gonna piggyback off of what you said, like definitely gotta talk to them, but empower yeah, your teachers to have these conversations. Um, allow your, give your teachers the leeway to open up and talk but so that they will have someone immediately because they can't always go to the district leader or the principal. So empower your teachers to have these conversations. Great point. Real quick, Marcus, put your uh, contact information in the chat room there. Go ahead, Dwight. Uh, nothing more than what, what you know, these gentlemen said. Um, and I'm, I shared that also in the in the chat, you know, just consider reaching out to students, having fall group meetings, you know, Virtually, I say it virtually in, in light of um, social distancing. Uh, send out emails, just let people know, you know, here are the things that we're thinking, not not saying here's our plan, but just inform people because in the absence of information, people start to create their own narrative and their own story, um, and it may be completely off. So I think the more we can share, get them, share the process that we're going through as opposed to the final product, I think that'll help alleviate some some stress. And open up conversation. Awesome, Derek. Any final thoughts on that question? So, sure. Just so, just very quickly, instead of a step, a strategy. I'm instead of a step, I'm going to give you a strategy or a mindset shift to consider. Um, right now, start reading or thinking about the role of activism in your school and how it can powerfully transform learner and uh, learners and learner leadership. Barbara Bray writes about this. In in, person, in her personalized learning work. Uh, if you want to search Barbara Bray and look for an infographic there, but just look at the role that activism can play towards developing student leadership. But determine what your role is going to be, determine how you're going to put students together, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. But there's nothing more powerful and we'll give them a vehicle to have a great voice. Yeah, I think the other thing as we close out, gentlemen, I want you to think about one resource uh, that a principal can dig into right now. I'm reading the book White Fragility. Uh, it's been really eye-opening. Uh, what's one resource, either a TED Talk or a website or a book? Uh, Quint, you go first there, buddy. It looks like you have something ready to rock and roll. Yeah, leading with intention. It really just talks about how you spend your day as a an administrator, as a leader inside your classroom. and gives you systematic steps to make the most of your time. Excellent, thank you. Who wants to go next? It's interesting you say that book because that was a book that I just ordered on Amazon just last week. So shout out, I'm excited to read it. Um, I've really been digging into some of the social media and reading stories of people and seeing what's going on around the world. Twitter is a great way to connect and, and you'll be able to, to see a lot of resources that people are posting. So utilize the networks that you currently live in and don't feel like you got to go out and grab a whole bunch of other stuff. Great, great point. Thank you. Derek or Dwight? Um, I'll stay, stay on the Twitter piece. Um, Chris Emden, Christopher Emden, E-M-D-I-N. He wrote a book called For White Folks to Teach in the Hood and the rest of y'all. Um, great. So, so first of all, great book. Second, great. great person to follow, great voice. You know what? Also, Baruta Kefele, he wrote a book about um, teaching, uh, teaching black boys. And he's a great, great leadership resource as well. Okay, uh, Quentin needs to jump off, so I want to thank, thank Dr. Lee before we get to Lee Carter. Thank you so much, Quentin. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Dr. Lee. Um, I would say um, if, it, if it's just overall leadership and times of disruption, you know, 
obviously I mentioned it earlier, but um, Mark White and, our, and my book about that because it provides a framework. It's not just stories. It's, you know, stories are, it's tell stories of principles in the trenches and leaders in the trenches, but it also gets the framework of that. And this is a disruption, um, probably the biggest disruption we faced in, in, in quite a long time as educators. Uh, another book I would recommend is How to Be an Anti-Racist. Uh, that, that's one that's hot on the charts right now, I think is very relevant. And if, again, it provides practical tips and strategies on um, empowering um, empowering whites to then confront racism during those private conversations that occur behind closed doors, around the kitchen table, um, at baseball games, softball games, hockey games, football games, um, how to confront it um, and why it should, why you should, because those types of things would then help diminish some of the things that we're seeing in terms of the microaggressions. Excellent. Gentlemen, I got to tell you, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I got to thank you for uh, what a great friendship I have with you. And just a great connection. I learned from you. Dwight just posted on Facebook something really challenged my thinking around this. And I would just I'll encourage all of our listeners to follow these leaders on Twitter. Uh, they, will they will challenge your thinking. They will inspire you, and they will motivate you to do great things. I just want to thank everybody. If you want to get connected with me in any way, chaselearning.org is my website, chaselearning.org. Or you can follow me on Twitter, Twitter at Dr. Bill Ziegler. It's D-R-B-I-L-L-Z-I-E-G-L. I want to thank you so much, gentlemen. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. Thank Appreciate you so much. Love you all. Good luck, everybody. Thank you. Guys, you be safe out there. Yep. Thank you so much. This does end our session. Thank you so much.